Regarding the agenda, so we will have three presentations to date covering the IPR protection and enforcement in Malaysia, as well as the IPR protection from the civil and criminal law perspective. Uh, right after each uh, presentation, we will have time for one or two questions from the audience. And at the end of the meeting to date, we will have the Q&A session to address on the question you might have for the speakers. Participating in the meeting today is our great honor to welcome the presence of Dato Mohammad Roslan Mahajudin, Director General of My IPO, and Mr. Francesco Flores, Head of Trade and Economic Relations from the EU delegation to Malaysia. Before we start our meeting today, I would like to invite Dato Mohammad Roslan Mahajudin, Director General from My IPO, to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, salam sejahtera. Mr. Francisco Flores, Head of Trade and Economic Relations, EU Delegation to Malaysia. Mr. Tiago Guerrero, Project Leader Arise Plus IPR. Ms. Carolina Pitaj, Deputy Project Leader Arise Plus IPR. Uh, the Honorable Judges of the Session, Sessions uh, Court uh, Malaysia, Deputy Registrar and Senior Assistant Registrar of High Courts, Deputy Public Prosecutors, Distinguished Speakers, Participants, Ladies and Gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon to you all. On behalf of uh, the Intellectual Property Corporation of Malaysia, MIPO, I am delighted to welcome our distinguished speakers and participants to this online roundtable discussion for judges and uh, prosecutors hosted by Arise Plus IPR, European Union Intellectual Property Office, or EU IPO. It is indeed uh, an honor for my port to be part of this significant event, which involves particip participation from legal profession, mainly honorable judges of sessions court from each state in Malaysia, deputy registrars of high courts from each state in Malaysia, deputy public prosecutors from the attorney general chambers, and enforcement officers from the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am aware of that this roundtable discussion was intended to be organized physically since February last year. However, due to the pandemic COVID-19, we need to postpone and finally, we managed to make this session happen through online. In this opportunity, I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Arise Plus IPR for making it possible. Ladies and gentlemen, IPR protection is critical in fostering innovation. IP is an asset that needs the same protective rights as other physical property. In today's development, of modernized era has contributed towards new directions in the area of IP. We can witness the increasingly central role occupied by technology and innovation in economic strategies due the industrial revolution, such as the application of artificial intelligence or AI, which may reflect to the rise of challenges in IP administration. Such developments may have implications for the work of judiciaries and enforcement bodies in the future as well. 
In this respect, although if national IP laws are in place and correspondingly conform to international standards, continuous efforts in enforcement initiatives at the national level are still required to effectively protect both foreign and local investors, IPRs, and interests. Judiciary administration of IP also need to be reviewed and enhanced in order to reflect to these modern changes. Ladies and gentlemen, this roundtable discussion aims to contribute to the capacity building for Malaysia judges and prosecutors, as well as enforcement bodies to facilitate in the effective and expeditious disposition of IP cases. The, this, the session will also serve as a platform for sharing EU decisions and judicial practices, which may be, interest, which may be of interest to and being commonly accounted by the members of the judiciary and prosecutors in Malaysia in dealing with IP cases. In this session, our learned speaker, Mr. Azim Nazuri from Enforcement Division, Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, will be sharing the IPR protection and enforcement in Malaysia by focusing on enforcement of criminal IP under the jurisdiction of MDTCC and mechanism taken to combat piracy and counterfeit goods. Besides, the participants also have opportunity to learn and enhance the knowledge on IPR protection on criminal law and civil law from EU perspective that will be delivered by our European speakers, Justice Angel Galbo Pico from Court of Appeal of Madrid, Spain, and Mr. Valerio Papa Giorgi, IP expert from EUIPO. Ladies and gentlemen, it is hoped that by the end of this session, Everyone will have to better understanding on IPR protection from civil and criminal perspective under Malaysian law and EU law. Through the interactive discussion, this session may ele elevate the quality of IPR decisions rendered by judges and promoting the expeditious disposition of IPR cases by enhancing their awareness of EU best practices in adjudicating various IPR issues and in adopting expedient rules of procedures. I also believe that this session will be one of the steps towards fostering greater cooperation between enforcement, prosecutors and judges to the enhance enhancement of, I of the IP regime in Malaysia. I wish you all a fruitful discussion and every success in your deliberations. I would like to once again thank the IPR Plus for organizing this session. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Dato Mohammad Roslan Mahachudin, for your very kind opening remarks. Um, next, uh, we would like to invite Mr. Francesco Flores, Head of Trade and Economic Relations from the EU delegation to Malaysia to have the welcome remarks and to officiate the event. Dear Director General, uh, uh, dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon from Malaysia. Good morning for you in Europe. It's also an honor for me to say a few words um, opening this roundtable discussion. Director General said uh, most of it, so let's see if we share the <laughs> speaking points. <laughs> You were also projecting some uh, information Arise uh, Plus. Arise Plus is one of the flagship programs that the EU is funding to support uh, regional integration in ASEAN. And in particular, Arise Plus IPR is one of the components focusing explicitly on uh, strengthening the intellectual property system in, in ASEAN. Malaysia and the EU are important trading and investment partners. The EU is the third largest trading partner of Malaysia and the largest holder of foreign direct investment in Malaysia. There are a lot of investments uh, in, here and uh, we can even uh, make a stronger uh, bilateral economic relations 
to do so, also strengthening the protection of intellectual property rights is important. It's not only good for the innovators, uh, the creatives and the investors that make money, <laughs> but uh, for the entire economy of the country because of the contribution to the economic growth, employment, and also tax revenue, which is something that uh, governments always need, but in particular in these times where we have to finance the recovery after the COVID crisis. So judges, prosecutors, and enforcement officials play a key role. The more uh, efficient is the prevention repression system, the more likely is that the perpetrators will be caught which is a strong deterrent uh, to commit uh, crimes or uh, civil um, irregularities. According to the European Commission latest report on the protection and enforcement of uh, intellectual property rights in third countries, IP enforcement remains a challenging issue in Asian countries. Criminal prosecutions and civil actions are sometimes long and costly. So IP rights holders are discouraged from uh, pursuing the case. And uh, criminal and administrative penalties for IPR infringement are sometimes not dissuasive enough. So perpetrators will take the risk. Either they will not be caught or they will not pay a, a sufficiently dissuasive uh, sanction. On the positive side, the report noted that the improvement of IPR protection and enforcement in the Asian region in the last years has been significant. In particular, in Malaysia, there have been improvements in the increased engagement of uh, Malaysia's authorities and enforcement uh, agencies uh, about awareness raising and enforcement of rights, as well as the establishment of the specialized IP court which has accelerated the judicial proceedings. I don't take time to the experts. I thank you all of you and I wish all of us a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Francesco Flores uh, for your kind welcome remark to officiate the event today. Um, so now we would like to invite Mr. Asim Natsuri, um, Head of Trade Description and HALA Unit, Enforcement Division from the Ministries of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, with the first presentation on IPR protection and enforcement in Malaysia. Mr. Asim Natsuri uh, graduated with uh, LLP from the University Kebansa, Malaysia in 2002. After graduation, Mr. Azim was admitted as an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya and practiced as a lawyer in a legal firm for several years. In April 2004, Mr. Azim uh, joined the Enforcement Division under the Ministries of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs. Previously, Mr. Azim was appointed as Head of Enforcement Officers in State Enforcement Office in Malacca and then as Head of Enforcement Officers in Kuala Lumpur Office. Currently, Mr. Azim is the Head of Trade Description and HALA Unit in Enforcement Division under the Ministries of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs. Mr. Azim Nazuri, the floor is yours. Thanks, Ms. Yung. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good afternoon. Bahagia Datuk Maruslan. DG Maipo, Mr. Francis Flores, Lennox Speakers, uh, Honorable Judges, Deputy Registrar of High Court, DPPs, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank and congratulate the organizer for organizing this event. And also thanks for inviting the Ministry from the Enforcement Division to be part of the speakers for us to share uh, our experience in enforcing um, ITR in Malaysia. Um, next, please. Uh, before I start, uh, my presentation will be roughly around 15 minutes. Basically, I will share some of the background of protection of laws of IPR in Malaysia. Second one, I will brief a bit on how the enforcement division, what are the mechanisms we use, and also the statutes related 
connected to enforcement. The third one, I would like to share some of the powers under the law. Then statistic of cases taken by MDTCA since 2016 to 2020. And also to share some of the experience in coordination with other enforcement agencies. And last but not least, some of the photos related to enforcement. Okay, next please. Okay, a bit on our division. Basically, we were established way back in 1972 under Ministry of Trade and Industry. Basically, the main uh, task given to us way back in 1972 was to curb inflation during the time. However, uh, due to some restructure on uh, 1990, the ministry was restructured to form two different ministries, namely MITI, International Trade and Industry, and MDTCA. Uh, whereby the enforcement division is uh, under the MDTCA. Basically, there are four main core duties of the enforcement division. First is to empower enforcement to deal with rising cost of living. Basically, we enforce Price Control Act and anti anti profiteering 2011. Second one, our main core duties is the enforcement and protection of IPR. The third one, the enforcement of trade laws and protect consumer rights. Basically, there are several laws under this core duties. For example, we protect higher purchase act, uh, higher purchase agreement under the higher purchase act, uh, also weigh and measure act, and also under consumer protection act 2000. And last but not least, we was one of uh, our main core duties are uh, the enforcement and eradication of malpractices in subsidized control goods. For info, in Malaysia, we still have several control goods that are subsidized by the government. For example, the uh, LPG, uh, cooking oil, one kilo, so still under subsidy of the government. A bit on our enforcement division, in Malaysia, we only have around 2,258 enforcement officers as at 25th January. We have 72 branches in states and districts and we enforce around 12 different statutes. Next, please. Okay, basically in Malaysia, as we all know that uh, MIPO is the custodian of IP law in Malaysia, but they have no enforcement mechanism. So the enforcement of criminal IP is under the division of NDTCA. Um, basically, there is there are only two types of IPR that are enforced by the law, I will explain it uh, later. If we look at way back in 2000, Malaysia was placed under the U USTR priority watch list. During the uh, during that time, there is a lot of uh, counterfeit goods and also piracy uh, by of DVDs and VCDs at the market during that day. If I'm not mistaken, our DVDs and VCDs Manufactured in Malaysia can be found all over the world. If I'm not mistaken, during that time, in 2002, there are several improvements was made by the government, and then uh, Malaysia was then removed from the priority watch list in 2012. For example, there are several steps taken by the government to counter, to combat counterfeit goods. Uh, for example, we have two separate special task force committee. First, we have special task force committee in combating piracy. The second one is special task force committee to combat counterfeit. However, since if I'm not mistaken, in 2014, we combined the both of special task force to one, uh, which is known as special task force committee in combating piracy and, and counterfeit. So basically the members of the special task force comprise of several law enforcement agencies such as the police, customs and local council. Uh, on top of that, the committee also comprises of uh, the industry itself. For example, the association um, related to IPR. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, among the, some of the association was um, the Motion Picture Association, the Recording Industry in Malaysia and several other uh, associations. On top of that, we also have a good cooperation and continuous effort with brand owners with regard to the 
capital gain sharing, uh, joint operation, and of course, training. In fact, uh, the brand owners also uh, organize a training to employment officer and also to the custom as well in order for us to get familiar what are the differences between the original goods and non-original goods. Uh, other than that, we also, several cases were actually taken under the Anti-Money Laundering Act 2001. Um, next question. Thanks. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, we only enforce on two different IP in Malaysia. First, the copyright, and the second one is the protection, the enforcement of trademark. So, uh, in other words, we don't have an uh, enforcement tool in enforcing patent, in, uh, geographic indication, and other IP. Basically, the law related to copyright is our Copyright Act 1987. Mm. The second one, I would like to emphasize on the Optical Disc Act 2000. Basically, the Optical Disc Act 2000 was uh, resulted way back in 2000 in protecting copyright by way of licensing regime to the optical disc manufacturing plant. If I'm not mistaken, way back in 2001, we have 44 licensed optical disc plants. Right? But right now, we only left three optical disc manufacturing plants in Malaysia. Uh, the second one is the uh, uh, enforcement of protection of uh, trademark under Trademark Act 2019. Previously, the act, uh, the enforcement was taken under the TDA Trade Act 2011. Okay, next. next. Basically, there are several powers uh, um, under the law. Basically, we have the powers of investigation powers to require information, to seize documents, power of arrest, enter premises, inspect, seize goods, etc. So basically, these uh, four different statutes give us uh, uh, sufficient um, powers to enforce the law in order to protect copyright and trademark. So these are the several uh, mechanisms that we did throughout the, uh, the years. First, we do have several action on clean up shopping malls. Before this, we can easily find uh, counterfeit goods or I would say previously DVDs at shopping malls. But now we can hardly find, still there, but it's quite hard to find. And also we have a specific, um, I would say a program last year. We issued uh, reminders to landlord, uh, to premise owner, uh, since October 2020, as at 31st December, we already issued around 1,645 notices, reminders to the premise owner as a reminder for them not to rent their premises or to let their premises being used as a place to sell or to um, to use as a um, counterfeit goods. The second one, uh, we do have some arrest case uh, where we can we try to charge the accused as soon as possible. But uh, this, uh, but due to COVID nineteen, since March, our MCO uh, hold the the arrest case due to the uh, COVID nineteen. This, the third one, we do have specific units to counter online matters. We call it a cyber and digital section where we counter online matters. We do have uh, action by way of remove contents or take down infringing website. The fourth one uh, program with brand owners and um, copyright owners with uh, business software alliance. We do have some um, campaign hit by the industry. And of course, the amendment of the Trademark Act 2019. We also have some public awareness and also some sort of program awareness to shopping mall. Uh, it's like a self regulatory campaign. If I'm not mistaken, according to our uh, statistic, we have uh, made 
complaint uh, campaign to around 110 malls involving 5000 plus premises next please Okay, statistics shown is uh, related to counterfeit cases. We look into the statistic and the goods itself. There are several types of counterfeit goods, food and beverages, medicine, cosmetics, cigarettes, so on and so forth. So 2000, from 2016 to 2020, there are around 3,647 cases with the seizure value of uh, next. Eighty-two million, equivalent to around 20, 20 million USD. So if you look at the seizure value, quite quite a numbers, especially on uh, the third para, the clothes, watches, stationery, leather good. Sorry, uh, error. Okay, next. Okay, this is uh, the statistic on copyright cases. Also, from 2016 to 2020, we can see as in uh, the case, the numbers is uh, going down. If you look at the statistic, statistic, 2020 only 103 cases, mostly related to online matters. Uh, sorry, uh, they are also related to online cases. If we look at the lower side, the statistic on site blocking and content removal, whereby this type of site blocking and content removal, you get the, the um, system and cooperation with uh, MCMC. MCMC is multi MCMC is Multimedia Commission. Uh, total numbers of site blocking in this back in three years is. 1,101 site blocking were made, and around 897 content removal were made during these two years. Okay, next. Okay, these are some of the sample of coordination with other enforcement agencies. First, at the border, we have a good cooperation with uh, customs. For example, last year, in second on November, we managed to confiscate a container of full container of uh, counterfeit cigarettes in Klang. Uh, before that, we managed to confiscate twelve containers of uh, cigarette pack cigarettes also in Johor. And of course, cooperation with police, the Royal Malaysian Police, on intelligence sharing. And of course, the Malaysian Commission and Multimedia, Multimedia Commission on matters related to online. Of course, we need to have a cooperation with MCMC, with the uh, local council also, on the information on ownership of businesses. And last but not least, of course, we have a good relationship and also coordination with IPR owners, especially on intelligence sharing, joint cooperation, operation, and of course, on the product training itself. Okay, next. Okay, these are the samples of the gallery that I, I can share. If we look at the left side, the operation with the brand owners on uh, counterfeit liquor. This is uh, counterfeit, not a uh, contraband. At the lower left, operation with the custom at the port uh, related to cosmetic goods. At the right side is the counterfeit uh, printer, cartridge, cartridge printer, toner. Okay, you have to be very careful on matters related to the counterfeit cartridge because they use the original uh, cases, they just refill it with the cheap uh, ink. Next. Okay, the left side was the cooperation with uh, Levi's. The right side is actually a cooperation with um, Harley Davidson representative in Malaysia. Actually, we managed to get the uh, accused via the, uh, the accused selling via online platform. Uh, we managed to get the store uh, second in Malacca, around 130 kilometers from Putrajaya, Ali Davidson. Okay, next.
Okay, these are sample of cases related to online matters. If I'm not mistaken, these are the counterfeit, the stickers made by Microsoft. Okay, so also we have to be very careful. Next. Okay, this, uh, this is quite an old case. It's related to manufacturing plant, uh, unlicensed manufacturing plant. Uh, you can see the machine, the materials, the, okay, um, the material that used to manufacture the VCD, stamper the plastic use. Okay, next. Okay. The left side, if not mistaken, in the cases was taken in Tallinn Street uh, related to counterfeit Casio G Shop. And the, the, light, the right photo in Bahasa Melayu, basically, it was a counterfeit cat food. Even our cat also eat counterfeit cat food. Okay, next. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Otherwise, if um, you would like to raise the question for Mr. Azim, you can also send the question to us and your question will be addressed during the Q&A session at the end of the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Azim, for your presentation. Um, next, um, now we will move to the second presentation of the event to date. We would like to invite um, Church uh, Ankel Gago Beko uh, from the commercial law, commercial law Section Chairperson from the Court of Appeal of Madrid, Spain, with the presentation on IPR protection from a civil law perspective. Um, Mr. Ankel Gago Beko graduated in law in 1985 and joined the judiciary in 1989. In 2008, Mr. Gago assumed the office of the president of chamber number 28, specialized in commercial matters at the Court of Appeal of Madrid, his current position. Mr. Gago is legally qualified member of the enlarged Board of, of Appeal of the EPO as from January 2018, and he's participated regularly as key speakers for many regional and international events and training. He's also the professor for civil law, commercial law, and IP law, and also the author of various publications about IP law. Uh, Mr. Ankel Gagobeko, the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. I am, I am, I am honored to participate in this, in this activity, and I would like to express my gratitude to the representatives of, of the of the of the project of the European Union authorities there in Malaysia and also to the uh, to the authorities to the Mal Malaysian authorities and also to uh, participants in this activity. Um, my presentation will be divided in three into three parts. First, uh, there will be some uh, introductory words, and afterwards, I will move to the uh, core of this presentation, civil remedies against IPR, uh, uh, IPRs infringements. And the third part will be devoted to, uh, well, to some practical issues that arise in adjudicating this type of uh, cases from a civil law perspective. Any, uh, to begin with, I should say that any IP system in, in any country rests on three main pillars. First, uh, appropriate legislation. Second, infrastructures for the, man for the, for the appropriate management of the rights, for example, uh, patent offices or copyright collective uh, management entities. And the third element would be the, uh, efficient, um, the existence of uh, efficient inform enforcement mechanisms. And this uh, involves uh, measures aimed at preventing the non-authorized use of IP rights, also uh, measures aimed at preventing uh, 
uh, sorry, uh, at sanctioning such non-authorized use of IP rights, and thirdly, uh, measures providing the right holders with remedies for the damages caused by the uh, unauthorized use of IP rights. We will focus on this, uh, on, on the third element, the uh, enforcement mechanisms. And what is it sought uh, with these mechanisms? Well, mainly uh, what uh, we try to, uh, what we intend to obtain is effectiveness and promptness. We will refer to this third point, to the last point, to the enforcement uh, mechanisms from, and this is very important, from a civil law perspective. Uh, there will be a, another speaker afterwards who will touch upon the, uh, the matter from a criminal law perspective. And in dealing with this uh, question, with this uh, issue, we will consider the subject in the framework of the CRIPS agreement. Why? Because this agreement is the most comprehensive one, the most comprehensive international agreement on IP uh, to date. We have to say that uh, the CRIPS agreement is a minimum standards agreement. Therefore, according to Article 1, uh, this mean that, uh, well, this mean this means three uh, main things. First, uh, members, uh, this is uh, those states who are members to the uh, WTO, are obliged to provide for the standards of protection set out in the agreement. That is, the level of protection provided by the agreement must be respected by the, by the, by the members, by the uh, state members. And uh, this means that the various rights granted by the CRIPS agreement uh, have to be recognized in those member states. This is of paramount importance in the, in the case of Malaysia because as I, I have just uh, learned, there, there is no uh, legislation uh, providing protection to uh, IP rights other than copyright and trademarks. But, uh, well, we have also patents and we have also geographical indications and so on. And this is very important because all these rights are uh, protected in the, uh, in the TRIPS agreement. The second thing uh, that uh, derives from this first uh, uh, assertion is that informants of rights must comply with the CRIPS standards. We will refer to that afterwards. Also, according to Article 1 of the, of the agreement, uh, um, members can provide more extensive protection if they so wish. And thirdly, and last, members are free to determine the appropriate method of implementing the provisions of the agreement within their own legal system and practice. Uh, this is there is no need for, there is no obligation uh, for uh, member states uh, to implement new methods and new uh, practices, provided that the protection uh, can be um, given uh, with uh, existing, existing legal system and practice. Having said that, we have to uh, remark that the CRIPS agreement has a specific section dedicated to enforcement. This is part three under the title Enforcement of Intellectual Property Rights. And as we are talking of uh, this matter from a civil law perspective, uh, we have to refer to Article 42, according to which members shall make available to right holders civil judicial procedures concerning the enforcement of any intellectual property right covered by this agreement. This encompasses uh, the following civil remedies, injunctions, damages, and uh, other remedies. Uh, all these uh, matters are regulated by the uh, agreement. And in addition, we have a very important chapter, provisional measures that are of paramount importance when we are talking of uh, prevention and protection of IP rights. 
Moving to the uh, civil remedies against uh, IPRs uh, infringements, uh, we have here the uh, traditional remedies, the traditional means of protection of IP rights, injunctions and damages. Injunctions uh, are regulated, are uh, envisaged in Article 44 of the, of the agreement. Uh, they consist of uh, orders to desist from an infringement. This means that judicial authorities, according to the agreement, uh, have the power to issue an order to desist from an infringement, mainly to prevent the commercialization of infringing goods. But uh, maybe uh, one of the most important points here is that uh, uh, the agreement envisages an exception for goods acquired in good faith. Literally, according to the, according to the agreement, Members are not obliged to accord the authority to issue such an order in respect of protected subject matter acquired or ordered by a person prior to knowing or having reasonable grounds to know that dealing in such subject matter would entail the infringement of an IPR. The second uh, traditional remedy is uh, damages. According to Article uh, 45, um, or Article 45 uh, envisages the payment of adequate, adequate compensation for the injury suffered by the right holder because of an infringement by an infringer who knew or should have known that he was engaged in an infringing activity. In appropriate cases, and this has to be underlined, uh, in appropriate cases, where the members authorize it, this is, this is not binding on the members, this uh, compensation, uh, this compensation uh, implies recovery of profits and or payment of pre-established damages, this is called statutory damages, even, even where the infringer did not knowingly or without reasonable grounds to know engage in infringing activity. I mean, even when there is no, uh, we cannot uh, detect any will on the part of the uh, person who de facto is infringing uh, an IPR. And this uh, compensation also covers judicial expenses, which in turn may include appropriate attorney's fees. Article 46 refers to other remedies, mainly scissor and destruction. According to this provision, judicial authorities shall have the authority to order that infringing goods be disposed of outside the channels of commerce or, unless it would be contrary to the constitutional principles, destroyed without any compensation. And also, uh, shall have the authority, authority to order that materials and implements, the predominant use of which has been in the creation of the infringing goods, be disposed of outside the channels of commerce without any compensation. In any case, the uh, agreement underlines the need for proportionality uh, in issuing these other remedies, these orders, uh, the proportionality between the seriousness of in the infringement the remedies ordered, and also the interests of third parties. Many times when, um, or many times, or it could be the case that an order of this type has an impact on third parties, and therefore we have to take care of uh, the rights of third uh, persons. Also, uh, the agreement uh, envisages uh, uh, an in indemnification of the defendant, uh, where the plaintiff has abused enforcement procedures, Article 48. And the, this is a real risk. A competitor can um, provoke uh, a measure like this, but abusing uh, legal proceedings and this has to be this has to be stopped. And we have an obligation to prevent 
these from, uh, from Okuri. One of the most important chapters of the, of the agreement is that uh, devoted to uh, provisional measures. According to Article 50, judicial authorities must have the authority to order prompt and effective provisional measures in order to A, prevent infringements from occurring, and B, preserve relevant evidence regarding the alleged infringement. These provisional measures may be ordered even in audita altera parte, this is ex parte, this is without hearing previously the alleged infringer. In those cases where any delay is likely to cause irreparable, irreparable harm to be to the right holder, or where there is a risk, demonstrable risk, that evidence might be destroyed. For this to happen, it is required from the, from the applicant to provide reasonably uh, available evidence and also a security or equivalent assurance sufficient to protect the defendant and to prevent abuse. As you can see from the, from the, from the letter of the agreement, there is a need and there is an, uh, uh, there is an intention to strike a balance between prevention of infringement and also prevention of abuse by the right holder, because these legal proceedings may be uh, used to, um, to uh, let's say, to harm uh, competence or competition, sorry. And well, now I will focus on some uh, practical issues that uh, arise in adjudicating this type of cases from, I insist, I emphasize, from a civil law perspective or, uh, well, if you wish, from the perspective of a civil judge. Um, adjudicating these cases uh, has real complexity uh, in the sense that uh, it poses factual and legal critical issues. If we go to the, I mean, to, to the practicalities or to the, to the, to the daily uh, job, the daily work of a, of a judge, we can, we can see that the judge's main tasks in practice when trying a case are three. Fix the cases, assess, sorry, fix the facts. As, uh, second, assess those facts from a legal point of view. And third, establish the specific consequences that flow from such assessment. And in doing so, we can, we can find some issues. Here I have um, underlined, uh, well, three of the, of the main issues, uh, three of the main factual issues. Um, they refer to the assessment of different uh, circumstances that have to be fixed to uh, render a decision. One of the main problems, in my, one of the main issues, sorry, in, in my view, is the assessment of notional concepts used by law in defining the relevant conduct. This is, um, we have to give sus substance to some notional concepts used by IP laws. Here you have some examples. For example, likelihood of confusion on the part of the public when we are referring to trademark law, common general knowledge or personal skill in the art when we uh, refer to a patent law. And uh, one of the main points of the judgment is to uh, try to give substance to these notional concepts used by the law in uh, their projection uh, into the case, into the specific case that uh, is being adjudicated. Secondly, there are some issues regarding the assessment of evidence, and namely, I am referring to expert evidence. Let me emphasize here some, uh, some key notes. Uh, we have to reflect first on the role of the expert. I mean, the, the, the expert 
doesn't have the task to uh, elucidate legal questions. Mm. His job is to illustrate the court and also the parties on those matters that require technical knowledge. But the decision of the case, the assessment of the case from a legal point of view is for the judge. And um, in doing that, the court uh, has to assess the, the outcome of the expert opinion. Of course, the court is not uh, is not becoming an expert itself, but the court has to assess the outcome of the expert opinion, taking into consideration not only conclusions, but also materials, explanations, and analysis on which conclusions are based. I say uh, this because, for example, in my country, uh, any party or both parties can uh, use, can bring to the court their own uh, expert, and therefore we can we can have mm, two or more uh, expert uh, expert uh, uh, report reports, and this makes uh, our our life quite difficult. Also, there are some issues regarding the assessment of uh, damages calculation because uh, the parameter here is to uh, to fix uh, an adequate compensation. In the European Union, the, uh, there is a, a scheme for calculating damages laid down in the so-called Enforcement Directive, Directive 2004-48 of uh, 29th of April 2004. This scheme applies to any infringement of IPRs as provided for by the European Union law or the national laws of member states. It follows uh, the principle of restitutio naturalis, uh, meaning that there is no uh, room for punitive damages, and um, statutory damages are not envisaged either. This scheme is a twofold damages calculation scheme at the choice of the injured party. So the injured party can go for one of these two options. First, uh, he can go for the calculation according or following the negative economic consequences of the infringement, including here the right holders lost profits and also the unfair profits made by the infringer, uh, taking into consideration that these two elements are non-cumulative. And the second uh, possibility for the injured party is to go for uh, the so-called license analogy. This means that he will receive um, at least the price of a license uh, provided uh, that the or in 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 an ideal scenario where the infringer uh, would have asked or would have requested uh, for for this license and uh, the advantage of this second option is that the in your party uh, doesn't have to prove the uh, profits, for example, the lost profits or the profits made by the infringer. And also these uh, damages, according to our scheme, according to our system, includes the so-called moral prejudice that also exists, exists also or can exist also when we are talking of IP rights. And, and this is the, the last slide. Um, in adjudicating IP, uh, IP cases, IP cases from a civil law perspective, some issues also uh, arise related to the interpretation of IP laws. Here, we have to take into consideration that IP laws many times are brand new laws. And uh, this means that uh, they are not only changing the existing institutions in a determined country, but also giving rise to new institutions. And this means that uh, there, is, uh, there are no precedents in the, in the country. And uh, this makes the life of the, of the judge uh, in adjudicating these cases, this type of cases, quite, uh, quite hard. A second point here is that due regard 
has to be given to international law. Why? Because many IP laws uh, follow from the signature of an international agreement. And therefore, there is a, a need for the judge to interpret it, to, to interpret, interpret it in the law in harmony with international conventions. And also, there is a need for judges uh, for keeping abreast with the developing IP international law. And last, um, but not least, uh, there is a need also uh, for consistency with other jurisdictions uh, in interpreting IP laws. Why? Because as I have mentioned before, I, I, I have mentioned earlier, many national IP laws come from uh, or derive from uh, international conventions and therefore the uh, regulation, uh, regulation is quite similar in different uh, countries and also the problems um, concerning, for example, counterfeiting or, or piracy are the same in all countries. And therefore, we, there is uh, this need for consistency with the uh, judgments uh, rendered in other jurisdictions. And well, this is all for now. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be very glad to be able to uh, answer any questions you may uh, ask. Thank yes. you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mito Gapo. And uh, we have received two questions for your presentation, uh, so I will raise it now. Uh, the first question, if you could have to clarify more about the moral prejudice. Um, is the moral prejudice meant to safeguard the aggrieved parties? And uh, this is the first question for you. Yes. For example, when we are talking of, uh, of, an, of, 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 of the author of a song, who, uh, or the author of a novel, who is being sold, uh, well, via internet, and therefore, uh, well, uh, imagine that uh, the the author is not interested in selling this novel in a determined country. Well, this can happen, but uh, by internet the novel is uh, being sold in that country. Well, in this case, there is uh, the, 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 moral, the moral rights of the, of the, of the, of the right holder uh, is harmed. So uh, in this case, a, a, a compensation is foreseen according to our system. Sometimes, sometimes this is very difficult to envisage when we are referring to uh, certain types of uh, IP rights, for example, patents. Well, in the field of patents, it's very difficult to find moral prejudice. But uh, in other fields, uh, it is quite, uh, quite evident. For example, if we are referring to trademark, uh, imagine that I am the owner of a trademark. And uh, well, I am not interested in uh, my trademark being used for certain uh, types of, uh, of, of goods. And or my trademark is used for a very low quality goods without any permission from, from my part. And therefore, uh, here, apart from an economic um, uh, damage, there is also or could be there could be also a moral damage for the owner of the IP. Right. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Gaku, for your clarification. Uh, we have one more question for you. And um, may I invite uh, Mr. Awan Keresnada, uh, if you could like, speak out your question. OK. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer of this uh, webinar, I mean, for uh, organizing this very useful uh, webinar here. And secondly, I would like to thank the, his lordship, the judge of the Court of Appeal of Spain, uh, Mr. Angel, Angel Pico, for your brief talk. I mean, I find it's very in, invaluable and very informative. And of course, I would like to thank Mr. Azrim for, uh, from the Malaysian Ministry of Trade. So let me introduce myself. My name is Awan Krishnada. I'm a Sessions Court Judge of Tawa Sabah. Uh, 
Actually, I have a question for Mr. Adrim, but I think I'll ask them later. First of all, a question to his lordship, the judge from the Court of Appeal Spain. Now, as far as the European Union countries are concerned, uh, let me give a hypothetical example. Let's say if I am uh, in Germany and I have industrial designs and I have certain inventions, and, uh, but that design was copied without my permission and my consent by a company in Spain. So uh, is it right for me to lodge the complaint in Spain or sh should I lodge it to the authorities in Germany for both civil and criminal? Now, in as far as civil is concerned, uh, my second question is, uh, as far as the civil cases are concerned, are they standardized in terms of awarding the damages, damages to the to the companies? Because even though that offense was done in Spain, but because the the owner of the industrial design is in Germany, so how would the judge in Spain, when they handle a case like this, how will they assess the uh, remedy for damages? Will it be standardized? Will will it be like as if uh, it is uh, done in a court in Germany. And my second question to his lordship, the judge is uh, the, the judge of the, court of, uh, of the Court of Appeal of Spain is, as far as the criminal uh, criminal action is concerned, now which law which law will apply? If, if an industrial design in Germany has been has been copied, I mean, uh, or if there are infringements of certain, uh, not, not just industrial designs, uh, perhaps other inventions. And does it, is it a criminal offense in Spain? And if it does, so will, will that kind of offense be tried in Spain or in Germany? Thank you very much, your Lordship the Judge. So those are my two questions. And I hope the organizer will allow me to ask uh, Mr. Azim at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chris, uh, Chris Nada. It is a, a, an honor uh, for me to, to, to have this, this, uh, this meeting with, with colleagues from, from so far, and therefore uh, okay. a, great, a great pleasure. Yeah. Well, you, you are, um, uh, basically you are talking about, uh, or you are asking about the applicable law and the yeah. uh, court uh, competence. To, exactly. or, 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 the, or the jurisdiction jurisdiction competent to uh, try these type of cases. Okay. Well, I will make a, a, a distinction between right. civil and criminal cases. All right. Going okay. going to civil cases, and here we are talking basically we are talking of uh, well of uh, fixing the the existence of the of the infringement and okay. second uh, awarding awarding damages. Uh, concerning the uh, competent uh, competent uh, court, well, following our 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 um, legislation, and I am referring, you know, that uh, here in the European Union we have um, a system according okay. to which we have some some regulations common to all countries, all right. uh, but uh, still there are there are national regulations, uh, okay. national legislations, but yes. ac according to this unified. Uh, regulation uh, uh, that is becoming bigger and bigger uh, yes. in the in the field of trademarks, for example. Well, mm -hmm. everything now is is unified and so on, so on, so on. Mm -hmm. But according to this, we make a distinction uh, um, um, concerning the court that uh, is competent to try the case. It depends on what the injured party is uh, claiming for. Or is asking for. All right. You can go if we are talking in, in your in your example. We are talking of a Spanish company who is infringing yes. in both Germany, for example, yes. and yes. Spain. And well, I will add by way of example France and Ireland. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. So if you are the owner of the IP rights, uh, you can uh, you can bring the infringer before the uh, before the uh, the courts of any country in where uh, uh, where the infringement has taken place 
For okay. example, you can take the person to the Irish court or the French court or, or the right. a German, German court or, or the Spanish court. The only uh, thing is that if you uh, bring the infringer to, to the court of his domicile, right. I mean, Spain in this case, okay. you can ask for the total damages, I mean, for the damages Pro, uh, cost in all the countries, in all right, the four all countries. All right. But if you take the infringer to a court other than the court of uh, his country of residence, in this case, right. Germany or okay. Ireland or France, you can ask for damages caused by infringement in that country. I so see. the difference is that if you go for the court of the residence of the infringer, you can ask for everything, for all the damages. And if you go for another court, you can only ask for damages provoked or caused in that country. Okay. Um, concerning, uh, how, concerning the, the second question, uh, wall uh, damages. Uh, how, how can we determine the, 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 uh, the, the damages? I have, right. I, have re I have referred to this scheme. This is a, a scheme common to uh, all countries. And okay. of course, it relies on the evidence that the party can okay. submit to the court. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, well, maybe your uh, question was uh, intended um, mm -hmm. to determine uh, if uh, you can ask for all the damages in all yes. the or well this is this oh, is yeah, uh, right. this okay. is answered i think okay. yeah. and um well concerning criminal criminal law here the traditional the traditional principles of criminal law apply so therefore you can take the uh, the infringer to the court of the country where the infringement took place oh, okay. and and the uh, uh, applicable law is that of that country I see. Okay. But in this case, I have to refer also to the fact that first, more or less, uh, the, uh, the legislation is harmonized to some extent. All right. All right. To some extent, in national laws, to some extent. Uh, um, although you can find important differences between, for example, the Danish uh, legislation okay. and the Spanish legislation, All right. yes. criminal legislation. And yes. second, we have a very, very speed um, okay. a method of surrender. For example, okay. if a German court is prosecuting mm -hmm. uh, 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 an infringer and this infringer okay. is located in Spain, mm -hmm. well, right. it, may, it, it may take only one week I see. for the Spanish authorities to deliver, uh, to, 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 to surrender this infringer to the German courts. Uh, so uh, these are the means how we can uh, we can uh, tackle these kind of problems. Right. Okay. All right. So, so thank you very much, uh, uh, your lot for the yes. for the answers. Yes. yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gago, for uh, answering the question, and also thank you, uh, Mr. Awan, uh, for raising your questions. Yes, we still have time for you during the Q and A session uh, yeah. at the end. The meeting to date. All right, yeah, thank you. And I think, uh, some questions from the audience for Mr. Gago. So, all your questions will be addressed um, at the end of the meeting to date. Now, we would like to move to the last presentation of the event to date. Uh, we would like to invite Mr. Valerio Babajori. Uh, IP cooperation expert from the EU IPO with the presentation on IPR protection from the criminal law perspective. Uh, Mr. Valerio Babajoris is an international cooperation expert supporting the enforcement activity within on EU funded projects with 27 years of professional experience in the government administration at national and international level dealing with law enforcement issues. He is uh, previously employed as a detective inspector by the Italian Gattia di Fannanza for nearly 10 years and later by Europol, the European Law Enforcement Agencies, as an um, in intelligent officers and team leader for another 10 years. 
Mr. Valerio Babachoris is specialized in international project management, intelligence analysis, government and law enforcement, with a focus on security, cybercrime, and intellectual property rights infringement. Uh, Mr. Valerio, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doong. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all the organizers uh, and uh, the, uh, the um, obviously, the um, colleagues uh, from the Malaysian office, the Malaysian authorities, and the participants for having me today as a, as a speaker at this very interesting uh, event. So I will, uh, I will, in the limited time that I have, I will try to cover all these different uh, topics that are listed here in the in the contents in the um, in the contents of the presentation. I will also dedicate uh, some uh, uh, specific uh, uh, slides to the issue of uh, uh, confiscation um, because I think this is quite an important uh, aspect when dealing with IPR infringements from a criminal law perspective. So without further ado, I will move, let's say, to the first slide of the presentation. And before actually we uh, go into details of the criminal law aspects, I think that it's uh, quite important to understand the, the difference between uh, uh, the civil uh, uh, approach and the criminal approach. So, um, I mean, we have also listened to um, uh, the previous speaker to Judge Galgo, very interesting presentation. So we, we have already, let's say, uh, uh, seen uh, what are the consequences for IPR infringements at the civil law level. I would only add that from a civil law perspective, so basically uh, um, we look uh, more for the loss or the gain between the, the victim and the someone that has harmed the victim and from there uh, some kind of mathematical factor is uh, used for the indemnification of the victim. At criminal level the approach is quite different because the victim in this case in, is the entire uh, social group. Um, the judge will actually look at the values of the group that have been harmed. And uh, even though the, the um, let's say, uh, the central point of the lawsuit is, uh, um, um, let's say, is the, um, is the victim, in this case, it becomes some kind of secondary in, uh, uh, in relation to the social group. So the approach is no longer an, uh, some kind of uh, indemnification, but, uh, rather uh, a social group protective uh, um, approach. But when is the social group actually affected? And here we have a set of questions that are open for debate. Maybe when a person downloads a music file or uh, any other uh, copyright protected file for his or her own personal benefit, or maybe when it concerns uh, dangerous uh, uh, products, when actually for the production of these products, uh, uh, some other violations have been committed, uh, some uh, such as, for instance, the, uh, uh, the illicit labor of, of children. Children have been employed to produce these goods. Or also in relation to other financial violations, uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, tax evasion, the fact that obviously the producer of fake products uh, don't pay taxes. So these are, let's say, uh, all open questions uh, to discuss uh, how and if and how the social group is actually affected. But let's see what are the legal instruments that are available for uh, a criminal lawsuit. Um, we've heard that uh, the TRIPS agreement is, uh, is uh, the basis for, uh, let's say, the different approaches that uh, uh, we can have to uh, IPR infringements. In fact, it covers uh, different aspects, civil law aspects, administrative law aspects, and also criminal law aspects. So in particular, Article 61 of the TRICS agreement says that members, so the member countries of uh, the TRIPS agreement shall provide for criminal procedures and penalties to be applied at least in cases of willful trademark counterfeiting or copyright piracy on a commercial scale. And uh, the remedies that are foreseen by this article 
are actually uh, in the form of fines or even imprisonment. Um, and uh, as I said, this is, this is the basis for uh, member countries to um, establish criminal law, criminal legislation in their own uh, um, territory. At EU level, uh, around the mid of the year 2000, I think it was around 2004, the Commission initiated a draft directive dealing more broadly with the criminal sanctions for specifically for IPR infringements. But actually, this directive was never approved because it went under further questioning by the member states. And to date, I mean, in Europe, we have two main texts that are actually uh, collective for all EU member states and are valid. We, we've heard before about the uh, Directive 48 of uh, 2004, the so-called Enforcement Directive, which is obviously not related to criminal law aspects, but to civil law aspects. And we also have the Regulation 608 of 2013, that is the custom uh, regulation related to IPR infringements. And these are the main EU documents that uh, uh, we have in the European Union. As said, I mean, at criminal law level, we don't have an EU uh, instrument, and this is left in the hands of the national legislators. Now, it is important to mention that uh, the, uh, uh, actually the conditions for, for bringing an infringement case before a criminal judge or even before civil courts are not always the same. Uh, at civil level, the courts will, will be called to assess whether the contested goods breach the intellectual property rights of the claimant. If the answer is positive, then there will be an infringement and, uh, and, uh, there will, and actually, uh, the infringers will be condemned civilly. As we have seen, stop commercializing, to stop commercializing the products, to cease to exploit the rights, to eventually withdraw the products from the market, to pay damages, etc. At the criminal level, an additional element, such as the willful intent to commit the crime, the intensio delicti, uh, um, on the infringer's side, um, may also be required to be proven. Uh, such criminal intent may not be easy to prove or may just be induced from the facts of the case. So, um, what a criminal sentence may contain? Uh, as we have seen, I mean, it can contain uh, fines, uh, uh, it can contain costs for the court to be paid, obviously, by the uh, author of the crime for the lawyers, imprisonment for them, obviously, and confiscation and also uh, damages. Now, um, in Europe, we can use, let's say, uh, some legal instruments to basically enforce certain procedures in other EU member states. So as I have said before, we don't have a specific directive on IPR infringements, but we have common legislation that is applicable directly in all EU member states. And we have, for instance, the Council Framework decision of uh, uh, 24th of February 2005 on the mutual recognition of the uh, financial penalties. And uh, we have the uh, Council Framework decision on the European arrest warrant that is actually directly applicable, and we will see later on when I will compare this uh, also to the, uh, um, uh, the uh, Transnational Convention on Organized Crime, the so-called UN uh, Convention, the Palermo Convention. We also have, let's say, a council framework decision on the application of uh, mutual recognition of confiscation orders. And finally, uh, we have actually uh, um, a regulation, an EU regulation on the jurisdiction and the recognition and enforcement in, of judgments in civil and commercial matters. Now, these texts uh, uh, cover offenses of participation in a criminal organization, fraud, uh, uh, laundering of the proceeds of crime, etc. Uh, these texts also provide that the competent authority in the executing state may refuse to recognize and execute the decision 
if it is established that the decision relates to acts such as that are actually regarded by the law of the executing uh, state as having been committed in whole or in, or in part in the territory of the executing state. So in that case, obviously, they are competent and they will decide on those uh, uh, offenses or in a place treated as such, or actually if they have been committed outside the territory of the issuing state, and the law of the executing state does not allow uh, for prosecution uh, for the same offenses when committed outside its territory. Actually, in the absence of case law on this issue, it may be safer in order to obtain uh, trans-EU enforcement of the convictions to prosecute and judge IPR infringements at national level first, and then raise the trans-EU infringement through uh, some other cooperation channels that we have at EU level, such as Europol or Eurojust. Now, um, IPR infringement is one of the rights that enforcement officers are in charge of protecting. Uh, uh, thorough investigation of this kind of violation may require a lot of time and technical expertise. Therefore, uh, when a first seizure uh, um, of fake goods is made, it is recommended to contact the right owner and assess whether they are interested in pushing the case further, and then decide whether an investigation is worthwhile. When approaching the right owner, it could be beneficial to secure an agreement, uh, actually an agreement to which uh, he or uh, uh, she will not enter into any kind of out-of-court settlement with the alleged infringer uh, without the knowledge of the law enforcement agencies. So, uh, this type of agreement is also very relevant for uh, those right holders that have a zero tolerance policy. You have to know, I mean, and you probably already know that counting siege the products and investigating and preparing a case for prosecution requires time and resources that obviously for a law enforcement agency could be devoted to other forms of, of crime and other investigations. And obviously the last thing that law enforcement agency want to to do is actually to de dedicate uh, uh, time to a case that will no longer be supported by the uh, right holder at a later stage. So to avoid such a situation that unfortunately occurs quite uh, often in practice, it is important to address this uh, issue at a very early uh, stage. It is also important in order to avoid subsequent surprises to check that the right holder has a clearly evidenced solid intellectual property right to support his or her claim against the alleged infringer. And this will prevent actually law enforcement agencies from working on a case which will later collapse um, owing to the fact that uh, there is a lack of properly evidenced IPR on the behalf of the claimant. IPR cases are sometimes perceived by prosecution authorities as some sort of private commercial litigations. Therefore, in order to boost the, uh, their uh, investigative interest, it may also be advisable to look whether this uh, uh, IPR infringement does not hide other violations of public order legislations, such as tax fraud, for instance, health and safety issues, money laundering, etc. If there is actually a choice of offenses to be pursued, it may make more sense to select the one that is easier to prosecute and that will give the best results in terms of conviction. At the end, the key issue of all litigations is evidence. And so it is particularly true in IPR infringement cases. Uh, it is uh, actually recommended to pay special attention to the gathering of all evidence. Uh, I mean, but this is valid for all uh, uh, forms of crimes, I would say. And also to the different rights and ownership that have been violated. 
In general, I mean, when it is decided to initiate an IPR case at criminal level, uh, one has to make sure that the case is really uh, solid. Uh, if, uh, let's say, the validity of the IPR is seriously challenged, or if the violation of the uh, IPR is not so obvious, so obviously it would be difficult to prove the criminal intent. And uh, I mean, as we know in business, uh, trying to being clever and attempting using loopholes of legislation does not always mean that you are a criminal. Now, this slide shows a certain number of legislation, different types of offenses that could be, for instance, uh, that could actually complement the IPR infringements. Uh, so it is actually of key importance for uh, the enforcement office, uh, officer to uh, uh, identify internally on which ground this violation should be tackled and whether the conditions for a criminal offense are met and which approach shall actually give the best result in court in the light of the results to be achieved. Now, uh, counterfeiting and piracy are normally uh, a very profitable crime, and this, they are actually not too much depicted from a social perspective, and uh, they, we all know that they have a low level of sanctions in uh, most of the countries uh, uh, in the world, a low level of sanctions, a low level of convictions. Uh, at the civil level, it is normally difficult for the right owner to demonstrate the actual level of prejudice suffered due to the lack of evidence that it can assemble and bring before a court to support its claim. At criminal level, the infringer or pirate can be convicted to pay a criminal fine. Normally, this is not so high and sent to jail uh, uh, and actually uh, uh, to serve a sentence that is normally also uh, uh, for a short period of time. And keeping in mind actually that jail is sometimes considered to be uh, a part of the criminal curriculum of a uh, uh, respected uh, um, offender, uh, it, this could also be not a very strong deterrent actually. So basically what happens, it happens that infringers, once they are out, they keep on doing this. I mean, they continue doing this work because it's a very profitable one. So what can be done and what has been done already? Uh, in Europe, uh, our Supreme Court has come up with some interesting uh, solutions. Uh, it actually, there is a sentence uh, that uh, uh, said that counterfeit products cannot be regarded as extra commercium since uh, there can be also competition between counterfeit products and goods uh, which are traded. So accordingly, tax related to the products is also due on the supply of counterfeit products. And there have been different uh, actually uh, pronouncements on this, for instance, the uh, Goodwin and Unstead for a case on perfume, but uh, some others also on uh, on gambling activities uh, and uh, on the export of goods. Actually, these cases are interesting because they deviate from previous case law where the European Court of Justice had assimilated this uh, crime to uh, the, uh, let's say, normal trafficking of illicit goods such as, for instance, narcotics or for forged currency, for which obviously uh, taxes uh, are not paid because these types of goods are considered out of the normal commerce. Well, in addition to this, it is important, as we know, to follow the money. Uh, this seems to be so far the most effective measure against criminals. This will not prevent them from continuing their criminal activities, but it will certainly affect them. And uh, uh, it basically, it will affect them in what is the most important thing for them, which is money. Now, freezing, seizing all assets and instrumentalities that were used or resulted from counterfeiting and piracy, this is also a very important aspect. Confiscating extensively the proceeds of the crimes that are in the hands of the criminal, but also in the hands of third parties that were used to dissimulate them, such as relatives, friends, parents, etc. This can prove to be a very effective weapon uh, in the hands of the law enforcement authorities. 
a weapon that uh, I mean we have seen is used more and more in this field. Now, at international level, and uh, let's say at European and EU level, I mean, uh, there are different instruments. As we have seen, we have the, as I've mentioned before, we have the Palermo Convention, that is the main international, uh, let's say, treaty to deal with uh, organized crime and also with confiscation measures. Then we have other uh, uh, instruments at European level, the Council of Europe, uh, um, conventions. We have actually two conventions from the Council of Europe. And at EU level, we have the Directive 42 of 2014, this dealing with freezing and confiscation of the instrumentalities and proceeds of crime in the European Union. Now, the Palermo Convention, uh, uh, I mean, I don't have to go too much into details on this because I'm sure, I mean, that you uh, are familiar with it. As I, I mean, as I said, it is an international instrument and actually it has entered into force in Malaysia, as I have seen in 2004 uh, and also in other ASEAN uh, countries. It's interesting, I mean, to see that Article 2 of the Palermo Convention uh, states that the organized criminal group shall mean a structured group, a structured group of three or more persons existing for a period of time and acting in concert with the aim of committing one or more serious crimes or offenses established in accord that, accordance with, the, with, the, with this convention. And in order to obtain directly or indirectly a financial or other material benefit. It also gives uh, a definition of serious crime. That is a crime basically where uh, the, uh, that is punished actually with the uh, uh, jail sentence or max or let's say the deprivation of liberty of at least four years or more. The Palermo Convention also gives uh, uh, information, I mean, uh, legislation on the participation on more detailed aspects related to participation in organized crime groups, on money laundering, on corruption, and other issues. Uh, related to the obstruction of justice. Now, which is the situation in Europe? In Europe, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the Directive 42 of 2014, and we have three, actually three different aspects, three different notions, I would say, of confiscation that are quite interesting. First one is the normal confiscation, which concerns whole or part of instrumentalities and proceeds of crime that correspond actually to the activities, I mean, uh, the criminal activities of the of the offender. Then we have, uh, uh, let's say, a more interesting uh, notion that is the one of extended confiscation that is applied to uh, property belonging to a person that is convicted for a criminal offense, which is liable to give rise directly or indirectly to economic benefit deriving from the criminal conducts, uh, conducts independently of the crime. So obviously this proceeds of crime and this uh, uh, don't have to be directly related to the commission of the crime. And then we also have the notion of confiscation from a third party that is involving even other people, other persons in this process. So this is again, even more interesting because uh, it actually concerns the proceeds or other property that corresponds to proceeds which directly or indirectly were transferred from the suspected or accused person to third parties or that were acquired by these third parties from the suspected or accused person. And here you have actually a comparison of these two instruments uh, that is uh, quite interesting because in fact here you can see that uh, the EU directive has uh, let's say stronger uh, uh, provisions uh, when compared to the Palermo Convention. So I would say this is quite a, a more advanced legal instrument. So the questions that one should ask is actually what are the rules, the specific conditions that uh, apply to confiscation in your country? Uh, if it would be interesting to know, for instance, if confiscation also in other countries uh, apply to IPR infringements, or if there are alternative crimes that can be uh, used in the uh, to apply confiscation to the infringer, 
and also if there are other uh, uh, some forms of confiscation that are more let's say uh, related to civil and um, administrative law rather than criminal law so uh, here i mean we have an interesting matter because on the first two columns on the left side, uh, we see a series of uh, uh, basically of uh, 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 not exhaustive, uh, but they're almost there, let's say, all IPR rights. On the right side, the two columns on the right side, we see different types of violation. So it would be interesting to know also from you uh, if the confiscation applied to any of these offenses. Now, after confiscation, obviously, we have to mention uh, the another aspect that is quite interesting that is related to the storage and destruction of goods, of counterfeits, uh, because this is an important aspect that is affecting uh, several countries uh, across the globe, uh, across the globe, so at international level, because uh, uh, unfortunately, there are high costs uh, at least, I mean, I bring the European, the EU perspective and the EU experience on this. There are high costs for storing detained and seized uh, fake goods. Uh, let's say that uh, um, at political level, there is not really uh, an agreement on who should be accountable for such costs. Uh, is it maybe law enforcement authorities? Is it the right holders? Is it criminals? Again, this depends very much on the, on the country. Uh, normally, it's the right holders that are responsible for this, but it really depends. I mean, um, as I said, the criminal law is not harmonized in the European Union. And then there are some aspects related to destruction of these goods that, uh, I mean, the, the destruction of these goods is not always uh, respectful of uh, certain environmental aspects. And, uh, and, uh, and again, I mean, uh, um, when we talk about specific goods that are particularly harmful for the environment, like some kind of fast moving consumer goods, like for instance, washing powders, uh, this type of goods should require ad hoc uh, destruction uh, and disposal procedures. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not the case, even in the European Union, as I have Witness it with my own high, uh, eyes how in certain countries, in certain EU member states, uh, these type of goods have been destroyed. So uh, let's see some aspects related to international cooperation and how to work with, uh, uh, with other countries, because this is also uh, an important aspect since we are dealing with the crime that most of the time it's an international one. So as we have seen, the Palermo Convention uh, contains some rules that are as a minimum, uh, uh, let's say, are, are considered as a minimum for cooperation for trans, uh, transborder cases. So we have forms of mutual legal assistance for retrieving evidences and also to perform searches in another country. There is a provision related to, the, uh, to joint investigative teams. The possibility to confiscate outside, uh, 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 let's say, the, our own country's borders, uh, and also the possibility for extradition. Now, the uh, um, I mean, uh, how much we can actually rely on the, on the mutual mutual legal assistance uh, and on our partner countries. Uh, uh, I mean, the mutual legal assistance uh, requires the dual criminality element. So actually, what we are dealing uh, with should be considered as a crime in both countries, in the requesting country and also in the receiving country, in the country that is receiving the mutual legal assistance. Uh, the drafting of a proper, uh, the proper drafting of an MLA can be really burdensome and expensive. If, for instance, we also have to include translation costs, and uh, I mean, for uh, for certain agencies, uh, uh, for judicial authorities, for law enforcement agencies with limited budget, this can be a very expensive process. The response time is sometimes very long. It can take even years sometimes to receive an answer. So. Uh, we have seen throughout the years that this activity is not always very, uh, to be honest, very time uh, efficient. There is also a lack of control on the process. And uh, 
The quality of the responses is uh, often random, so it depends very much on the requested country that has provided the answer. How do we do that? This, I mean, in the European Union, uh, as I said, I mean, uh, we can use the MLA related to transborder investigation, and we also have the extradition process that could be used. But in Europe, we have some specific legal instruments. We have actually the uh, directive on the European investigation order in uh, criminal matters. So basically an investigation order emitted, uh, issued by uh, an EU member state is directly applicable to another member state in another member state that uh, has to basically uh, uh, consider valid the um, uh, the uh, information provided by the requesting member state and the continued investigation in its own country. And also, as I mentioned before, we have the European arrest warrant that is directly applicable in any member state if it is issued by a judge in, in another member state. Um, the offenses that are covered by this uh, Council framework decision uh, are 32. So Obviously, we must deal with one of the crimes that are listed in, in this council framework decision. It's an annex uh, in its uh, two decision. Uh, and I can tell you that kind of feeding and piracy are also included in this uh, European arrest warrant. So they are covered. And if I finally get to my last slide for some conclusions, uh, I mean, and this, I mean, are actually basic conclusions. Uh, but let me say that there is a need for uh, uh, some knowledge about IPR, uh, uh, some, uh, um, let's say, awareness about IPR offenses and related crimes. So also, let's say, how IPR is related to other forms of crime, because sometimes there are some, let's say, limits when uh, an IPR case is, uh, is uh, uh, let's say, carried out from a criminal law perspective. So it is important to have some sort of awareness about these possibilities. Also, it is important to have awareness about the huge economic profits that are generated by IP crime, IP crime worldwide, because this is really uh, one of the most profitable crimes that are nowadays uh, um, exploited by organized criminal groups. And also, obviously, the need for cooperation at national level among the different agencies, because quite often we have seen that there is some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, dispute on the jurisdiction, for instance, between customs and police or other agencies. So we at EUIPO, uh, since a long time, we are promoting this dialogue, this interagency dialogue at national level, but obviously also at international level, it is very important to use the existing legal instruments and to use also the existing uh, uh, international organizations, uh, such as the WCO, Interpol, and, uh, and uh, those others that are available to uh, carry out, uh, to exchange information and carry out uh, um, an international criminal case. So thank you very much for, for, for your attention. Uh, I have finished and uh, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Valerio, for your presentation. Um, for the audience, in case you have question for Valerio, you can uh, send your question to the chat box or you can use the raise hand button and we will address um, your questions to the audience. Uh, before we move to the Q&A session and while waiting for your question uh, for the speakers, um, I would like um, to very briefly introduce to you the ASEAN IP case law database. Um, this uh, ASEAN IP case law database is a database that gathered together relevant IP decisions from the different ASEAN countries in one single place. So this database is designed at a case law reference tool for official from the IP institutions and the judiciary from the ASEAN countries. Um, this database is developed by the ASEAN IP offices with the support of the EU ASEAN project on the protection of IPR and is currently hosted by the IP office of Prunai Dasyu on behalf of ASEAN IP offices. 
Um, this um, ASEAN IP case law is available um, at this website, as you can see on the screen, ASEAN-IPCaseLaw.org, and it's open to the public. Uh, for now, it contains 262 case law and case law summary from Brunei, Jerusalem, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. Uh, so from this IP, uh, ASEAN IP case law, you can search um, the IP decisions um, based on the decision date or based on the jurisdiction. Like for example, when you key in Malaysia, um, you will find on the case law and case law summary uh, from Malaysia jurisdictions. And these case law are very recent, like as you can see, like we had the case law from 2019 as well as from 2020. Um, so we hope that um, after this event, you will have some time um, to assess to this ASEAN IB case law um, to explore further this database because we hope that this will be a very useful tool uh, for the IB institution and judiciary in Malaysia as well in ASEAN countries in general. So now we would like to move to the Q&A session. Um, we have received quite a number of questions. So uh, first um, I would like to uh, read out the first question for um, Mr. Gago. The first question from Mr. Sulaiman, Deputy Public Prosecutors from the Attorney General Chambers. The first question is, um, how do you quantify moral prejudice? What standard do you use? Will application is a means um, to, you, to be utilized to resolve an IP dispute or an IP case? I would like to invite Mr. Dago uh, to answer this question. Well, thank you very much for, for the question. Uh, well, it, it has two parts and I will try to be very brief because, well, I think we are uh, quite uh, out of time. So concerning um, quantif um, quantification of moral damages, I have to confess here that this is uh, a quite open question. I mean, parties uh, rely, well, <laughs> brackets, they don't have other option, and I close brackets, they have to rely on the on the criteria of, of, of the court. But uh, I have to confess that this is one of the most difficult uh, things because, uh, well, mm, yeah. If we, are, if we make a distinction between uh, um, economic uh, damages and moral damages, um, or making this distinction, we tend to, uh, to um, give, um, I mean, to diminish the importance of moral damages when there are, there are relevant economic damages, okay? But uh, well, this, is, uh, this is a very open question. I cannot provide you with, with standards. Uh, re uh, relating or, or in the case of economic uh, damages, we can identify uh, more easily standards, but this is not the case for moral damages. And concerning arbitration, well, there is a, a, a trend here in Europe and I think uh, throughout the world uh, trying to move uh, this type of cases or at least a significant uh, group, group of these cases to uh, arbitration and, and uh, ADR, alternative dispute resolutions. But in fact, uh, I think that um, this, there has not been so much success in this area. Uh, of course, uh, in some countries where there is a, let's say, um, a, a, an agreement culture, you can find it more easily. But there are, are uh, other countries where this is much more difficult. Um, and well, you, you, you can find arbitration and ADR or mediation uh, offices in many uh, patent or and trademark uh, national offices. But uh, I consider that the number of, of uh, cases uh, solved by this means are not so important nowadays. But it is a trend. I mean, you you, you can find uh, you can find many 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 uh, many events talking about arbitration and IPR, uh, mediation and IPR, and so on and so on. 
sorry, I cannot be more more uh, more concrete. Um, thank you, Judge uh, Gagor. Um, next question also for Judge Gagor uh, from Ms. Uh, Rares uh, Wari uh, from the session court uh, from Berak. A number of ju uh, jurisdictions have regarded IP infringement, for example, copyright infringement as meriting imprisonment. May we have your comment uh, on this in your jurisdiction? Uh, yes. I would like to invite again Judge uh, Gagor. Okay, uh, well, the previous speaker has been very enlightening about all this matter of criminal criminal uh, proceedings and IPR. So uh, I, 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 I refer to, to his speech. In any case, if we are talking of a more general question, let's say uh, criminal, criminal, uh, I mean, um, enforcement uh, via criminal actions or enforcement via criminal uh, civil civil actions or civil proceedings. Well, you have pros and cons in both cases. For example, if we are going for criminal for uh, criminal uh, proceedings, we have to take into consideration the principle of, of prior definition or, or legal definition. I mean, the, the conduct has to adapt exactly to the legal description of the case. And this is not always the case. We, we are not talking of, of, of the of the of the of the clearest cases, not about the way. When, apart from, from, from this type of cases, well, many times the conduct is not so clear. It doesn't fit so well and so exactly in the uh, legal legal uh, definition of the conduct. Um, of course, when we are referring to criminal proceedings, uh, we have some, some advantages. For example, uh, the promptness, the costs are, are, are lower, um, and so on, so on. But also, we can refer to advantages when we are uh, when we are talking about the civil proceedings. For example, the type of conducts that can be tried under these proceedings uh, uh, is uh, wider. I mean, it's more numerous. Um, there is uh, more control uh, on the part of the of the injured party. Uh, for example, he can uh, reach some agreement with the infringer uh, that can be very advantageous from the economic point of view. There is no need uh, for, for the injured party in this type of proceedings to prove the subjective element required for the, for the, for the, for the uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, criminal proceedings in order to obtain uh, the cease, uh, sorry, the, the, I mean, an injunction to stop the infringement, and uh, uh, this is easier in civil proceedings. Um, the uh, the spectrum of remedies against the infringement is wider also in civil proceedings. In civil proceedings, you can accumulate another uh, legal actions. Uh, against the infringer, for example, we are, uh, for example, unfair competition actions can be accumulated to the uh, IPR infringement actions. Also, in civil proceedings, you have <laughs> inconveniences. For example, uh, the costs are usually higher. Uh, the uh, time in getting a response is also uh, uh, longer. So. Uh, you, you have pros and cons in both in both in both uh, cases. Yes, um, thank you, Judge Blacko, for your answers. Um, next, we will have some questions um, for Valerio, and after that, I will invite Mr. Awan uh, Karis Rana uh, for your questions. Um, so the next question for Valerio is that um, infringement of IPR usually give rise to civil remedies with the aim to compensate the injured party. How about criminal sanction? Will it provide better remedies as a control mechanism to prevent IPR infringement? Uh, also another question also related to this um, criminal prosecution from Mr. Sulaiman. Has um, criminal prosecution of IPR case in EU effecti effectively deter IPR infringement? So I would like to invite Valerio um, to answer this question and to share the experience from the EU. 
Thank you very much, Dung. Um, I mean, as I said uh, during my presentation, uh, uh, it's obviously, uh, as we don't have, I mean, uh, harmonized legislation among 27 member states, uh, it's obviously a bit difficult to give uh, a collective EU response to this. Um, it depends very much on the member state. Uh, my personal and professional experience uh, since I was a law enforcement officer in Italy, but even after that at Europol and at UIPO, I have uh, often noticed that there are quite some differences among uh, EU member states. Uh, I come from a country like Italy, uh, where uh, it is a little bit like Spain or France uh, or UK, as UK was before a member of the European Union where basically uh, the sanctions uh, from a criminal law perspective are quite strong. There is quite good legislation, I would say. Uh, even though when we talk about uh, um, remedies, uh, as you were asking as the first question, my personal opinion, my personal experience uh, is that from a criminal law sentence, uh, the judge will not give uh, so high, let's say, uh, 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 indemnification for the victim, because uh, I think that, uh, as I have noticed also from different case law examples, that uh, for similar, let's say, products or violations, a higher uh, uh, indemnification was given when the case was brought, uh, brought before a civil court. Because, I mean, the criminal approach, as I said, is, is quite different, is to more punish the offender rather than indemnify the victim. So, again, the right holder also, if uh, he or she has a possibility, has to decide which way to go. And then, I mean, uh, I mean, I think I answered the second question with my introduction. I mean, it really depends on uh, on the member state. So, I mean, you have to bear in mind that we still have some member states, uh, at least one for sure, that is Austria, that is not punishing IPR infringement uh, with criminal law. So, IPR infringement are only legislated as a civil or administrative law. There is no criminal legislation. Yes, uh, thank you, Valerio, for your clarification. Uh, maybe the last two questions for Valerio. Yes, um, yes the first one is what are the statistic, uh, statistics on criminal IPR in EU for the last five years? And the second question is that um, do, do EU member states organize joint rate between IPR enforcement agencies and whether it's effective or not? Thank you. Yes. So for the first question, actually, this is very timely because uh, our office uh, through the observatory has recently published a report that is uh, publicly available on our website. And it is actually uh, uh, giving information statistics on the seizures, uh, detentions performed over the last, uh, uh, let's say in 2019. Okay, so not last year, but in 2019. And there is a comparison with the previous year in 2018. And you will see there that there has been a decline in the number of products that have been detained from 70 million units that were detained in 2018 to 40 million units in 2019. But the value of these goods has more or less remained the same. We are around 1.8 billion billion eh, euros. Now, the difference in the amount and the, the, the fact that there is a more or less the same value depends obviously on the type of goods and the market value of these goods that have been detained in the, in the, in the year of uh, under analysis. Um, if, I mean, the, 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 the colleague is asking statistics for the last five years. I'm not sure there is information of, uh, let's say, going back to five years, because I know that this exercise of our office was quite a difficult one, it was very complicated to get statistics. And now we have got to a point that we are able to, uh, let's say, get most of the statistics from most of the operating law enforcement agencies in the European Union. So this data that I mentioned before is not only customs, is also police, market surveillance authorities, market inspectors, all of them. So it's quite comprehensive, but it's 2018 and 2019. 
And then your second question, what was it about? Sorry, I forgot you had another last question. Was it related ah, to joint investigative teams? Sorry, yes. yes. Yes, absolutely. There is a possibility. There is a specific directive in the EU on joint investigative teams, and it's possible to organize joint investigative teams with for IPR violations. Uh, obviously, again, I mean, if the involved the countries that participate in the suit, uh, foresee, I mean, punish IPR infringements through criminal law. Otherwise, obviously, it's not possible. And these are quite effective. I mean, there have been a few of them, but they have been quite effective. Otherwise, as I said before, there are other cooperation instruments that can be used, such as Europol and Eurojust. They also participate in joint investigative teams. So their officers, their, their functionaries, they, they can participate in joint investigative teams, but as observers. And, but, but I mean, again, I mean, there are different possibilities. So there is a successful, uh, let's say, level of cooperation. Yes. Yes, thank you, Valerio, for your answers. Um, so now we will have time for one last question. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mita Awan Kerit Nanda from the session. Right. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll think I'll be very quick. Actually, I have three questions, but never mind. I'll just make it into one. Uh, the first is not a question. It's a suggestion to uh, to WIPO and uh, Europe and perhaps Malaysia, since ASEAN does not have a, a, you know an organization like the IPO. Uh, perhaps they can consider to give rewards to those who who report infringement of uh, uh, infringement of uh, copyrights or intellectual property. Meaning, which if there is a provision in the law that allows the court to to reward a person who informs the act of infringement of intellectual property, that it will encourage a lot of people. To come forward and say, okay, there is uh, some offense taking place. All right, that's just my my proposal. Okay, that, because I will have only the privilege of one question. I'll ask Mr. Azim. Actually, I have a question for Mr. Valerio, but never mind. Okay, Mr. Azim, uh, from the from the Malaysian uh, enforcement perspective and actions, uh, when you get a conviction in court against the infringer of intellectual property. Uh, do you ask the court to award uh, damages to the company which has to sustain the loss? Or are you just happy to let the court uh, uh, impose a punishment without awarding certain damages for the victim, victim of the infringement of intellectual property? All right, th th those are my only questions since we are very short of time. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Awang. Yeah. Thanks, Tuan Awang. Apa khabar? Okay, for the first suggestion, thanks for the suggestion. In fact, in MEMDTCA, we have a secret fund for the informer. Um, the second one related to the question, in fact, uh, the uh, prosecutor from the ministry, right. yeah. only um, um, we don't have that type of um, requirement or, or suggestion to the courts. Basically, we okay. just advise the uh, complainant for brand owners just to file civil in civil courts uh, okay. parallel with the criminal action. Okay, all right. That's it. Okay. So, okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Azim, for the question, uh, for the answers. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Awan. Um, due to the limit the time of our meeting. In case you still have questions for our speakers, you can send the questions to us and we will send the written answer to you in email right after the meeting. I think that you still have many questions for Valerio, for our church, um, Gako, and also for Mr. Azim from the enforcement division. So you can send on the questions to us and we'll send the written answer to you. Um, also, after the meeting, um, we will share with you the recording of this meeting together with on the presentation that our speaker delivered during the meeting, we will share with you uh, for your further reference also for, for your sharing in your office. To appreciate, um, to 
officially close the meeting. Um, we would like to invite Ms. Um, Carolina P. Touch, the Deputy Project Leader of Arrive Plus IPR, to have a few words. Uh, thank you very much, June. Um, on behalf of Arise Plus IPR project management team, I would like to thank all of you for your participation and active engagement in the meeting today. I hope that you have obtained a useful knowledge, information and experience sharing during this session. From Arise Plus IPR, we will continue our engagement with Malaysia government authorities and agencies to raise awareness, enhance capacity building of IP officials and enforcement agencies. To further, to further enforce IPR protection in Malaysia and also in the ASEAN region in general. My special congratulations and gratitude to Mr. Asim Nasuri, Mr. Angel Galgo and Mr. Valerio Papagiorgi for their comprehensive presentations and knowledge sharing. I would like to take also this opportunity to thank my IPO colleagues for their kind support and coordination to host this event, as well as all other activities under the Arise Plus IPR project. Thank you very much for staying put during this session. I have a nice evening or morning. Bye bye. Yes, thank you, Carolina. Um, so, dear colleagues, dear judges, um, dear prosecutors, we thank you very much uh, for your time and engagement in the event to date. Um, we would like to close uh, our meeting now. And we would like to kindly ask for a few minutes of your time if you could help to fill in the satisfaction survey, which um, you can find the link in the chat box. Um, your feedback is very important for further improvement in our future events. And also, um, as I mentioned during the Q&A, in case you still have questions for our speakers, you can write an email to us and we'll send the written answers to you right after the event. So we thank you once again, and we would like to wish you on health, happiness, and safety in the new year of 2021. And we hope to see you again in our future event. Thank you and goodbye.